Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Beaver and I'm the CEO of Fourth Trimester Arizona, a grassroots 501c3 collaborative of parents, families, health professionals, educators, and local organizations. We are on a mission to change the culture of parenting so no one has to do it alone. Thank you for joining us today for our eighth installment of the Fourth Trimester Ecosystem Lunchtime Conversation Series. For those of you who may, may be less familiar with Fourth Trimester Arizona, I'll begin with a brief introduction of our organization. We connect maternal and child health care providers, social support systems, and parent support groups to foster collaboration, education, and to increase access to local resources. Our programming includes three main focus areas, our monthly village meetups for new parents, our annual fourth trimester conference for both parents and professionals, and our fourth trimester ecosystem initiative for all who care for pregnant women and new mothers and their babies. The goal of the fourth trimester ecosystem initiative is to begin to have inclusive conversations about what is working and what needs to change to better support new families in Arizona. As some of you may know, our fifth annual fourth trimester Arizona conference is scheduled for April 23rd from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have some wonderful presentations, self-care opportunities, and exhibitors and sponsors on board this year to support the mental, physical, and emotional health of parents in the first five years after a baby is born and beyond. You can register and get your tickets today, and our generous sponsors enable us to provide this experience to low-income families without cost. So today for our conversation, we expect our time together to flow something like this. Our intention is to spend the majority of our time listening to the speaker's experiences and discussing what we heard in smaller breakout rooms. Before we get started, we want to go over a few key items to ensure everyone is able to fully participate. During the presentations, please post all comments and questions in the chat box. We'll be monitoring the chat and responding to your comments and questions. We ask that you please remain muted, except for when you're in the breakout rooms. Of course, then please unmute and join the discussion. We request that you enable your video if you're able, especially during breakout sessions. But if you run into bandwidth issues, please turn off the cameras. And lastly, we will be recording the session, so we're able to provide a recording after the session. All right, now on to the part we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Today, we're focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on relationships. And we'll hear from four perspectives in the following order. Travis Owen, a family law attorney with Cantor Law. Terry Ellers, a licensed marriage and family therapist with postpartum and relationship counseling. Joshua Boyd, Maricopa County Commissioner. And Stephen Miller, the philanthropic director at Chrysalis Shelter for Victims of Domestic Violence. A huge thank you to each of you for being willing to join us today and share your experiences. Travis, we'll start with you and your experience as a family law attorney working during the pandemic. If you wanna unmute and share with us your experience and how relationships have been affected during this time, that would be wonderful. Of course, uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak with everyone here. Um, it, it's a pleasure. Um, I'll say, you know, um, <laughs> before I get started, um, this isn't the first time Josh and I have been on camera together. Um, yeah albeit under different circumstances. Um, he's presided over a couple of trials I've done. So hi, Josh, <laughs> normally commissioner, I should say. No, it's just fine. And if I, if I may, uh, Travis, just briefly, Travis is just a, a remarkable attorney. Um, he's a great resource to families in the Valley. And I'm, it's my privilege, frankly, to be on a panel with him. Thank you so much. And likewise, Commissioner Boyle. Um, you know, my experience has been um, that, you know, the impact on the, of the pandemic on marriage and family, there really has been, unfortunately, an uptick um, in conflict between parties, an effect on employment, although that effect on employment is becoming less more recently. Um, I think families have, a, as a whole, have been more on edge because of the pandemic and um, even more um, sensitive than they already were, would be in the context of a divorce. Um, you're seeing more contentious cases um, in an already very contentious and, you know, some might say um, area of law that a lot of lawyers choose to avoid. Um, the pandemic has caused a lot of problems, um, it, but, the, you know, there are items that have gotten better, okay? Um, I think one of the things we're seeing is a constant increase in resources, um, dedicating mental health and counseling resources. Um, to families involving custody cases, for example. Um, 
There's items such as therapeutic interventionists that have been around for a while. Um, but I think one of the benefits is, is we've seen that transition to a great deal of kind of the way we're all talking right now, right? Um, therapeutic interventionists um, are a great resource that the court uses um, in cases perhaps where parents aren't both in optimal circumstances with children. Um, one side perhaps is a primary parent and I and Commissioner Boyles presided over numerous cases I have no doubt involving therapeutic interventionists. You know, I can tell you um, aside from that, you know, the court has instituted um, court ordered best interest therapists, Kobe, Kobe therapists. Um, and regardless how some may feel about social distancing, I think we can all agree that, you know, abused children and spouses should be a reasonably uh, as socially distanced as possible from those who are abusing them, right? I think, and one of the things that the pandemic has afforded us actually is the ability to do that. Um, I think there are also a number of financial resources available uh, for um, victims of financial abuse, whether through the courts, ne not necessarily, but, you know, uh, simple enactments. A great example we're going to, you know, we can talk about is um, the eviction moratorium. Um, spouses in divorces, regardless of what court orders say at time, do take drastic steps, selling houses from under other spouses. Um, trying to evict, evict people, things like that. And I think um, um, some of these eviction moratoriums, um, um, you know, limiting people's, uh, you know, creditors' ability to go after those sort of things has really been, you know, an unforeseen benefit that's come to this from spouses. Um, you know, mothers are a great example who aren't necessarily working and rely solely on the income of, of a father, of a husband. Um, to support them. And I think that's gotten better. Um, things that have gotten worse, you know, <laughs> I think we could talk about this for hours, right? Um, but from a family law perspective, you know, there's in-person access to family therapy. Um, I, I do think that in my experience, I'm seeing less and less of that. And it, as beneficial as, you know, um, the services of people like Terry, um, can be, I, I, you know, I'm seeing a number of people who aren't able to necessarily get in person to see their therapists. Situations with families where it, it's, it's almost necessary and pertinent to the best interests of the children. Um, uh, there's delays in court proceedings, right? Um, and that's still an issue that's going on um, out of county, in county. Um, I, I'm having trials set right now still via Zoom. Um, actually not Zoom, via Microsoft Teams. That's the, way the platform the court sets them through. But they're setting those out as far as July and August right now. Okay, and we're at the very beginning of March. Um, yeah, there are methods of getting in front of the court sooner, but you know those, those come at a significant cost at time to parties if they have counsel. Um, I, we're seeing a notable increase in contentious cases like I previously touched on as well. Um, and what was already a contentious area of law, domestic violence, financial abuse, substance abuse, custody and decision-making cases. Um, I, my experience in, I, I'm, in talking to other attorneys, I think everyone's seeing it a little differently, but I'm seeing more and more parties um, less hesitant to go to trial. Um, on, you know, on the flip side of that, I think... Um, I think the silver linings we can talk about is with virtual court and domestic violence cases. Um, they are a resource that's here to stay. Um, but on the other side of this, in trials, this can sometimes mitigate the impact of a victim's statements to the court. Um, you know, testimony or the court's ability to determine the veracity of the witness, those are things that as, as beneficial as we, we can present them to the court, um, I'm finding, you know, I, my preference is always to be in person, right? And I think that's a number of attorneys, but, you know, that, that's obviously not going to be a, the same for a battered woman. Um, and certainly, um, but at the same time, I, my experience is, is that that can be cathartic. I think those statements made in person to the judge can be very impactful. Um, and I do think, you know, some of these parties, abusers who are used to lying, or used to presenting in the way that they do, um, I think they have a harder time being in person and doing that. Um, these virtual hearings have been a great resource for parties of limited means. 
um, you know, who perhaps cannot afford counsel or have children at home. Um, so, you know, we're seeing an uptick in the ability to appear in court for a number of ways. Parties who live out of state or had to move to another state because they could no longer live with their spouse, so they're staying with family out of state. Um, being able to have the luxury of of going on Microsoft Teams and attending a trial in that in that manner. Um, and there is a lot of continued domestic violence training, um, including courts, attorneys, and mediators. And at our continuing legal education seminars, they really try to hammer home the idea of recognizing signs of domestic violence in cases where, you know, it's not necessarily evident. Everyone who walks in your door isn't going to walk in with a black eye um, or, or scratches or cuts on their arms. Um, knowing to ask the right kind of questions, even if someone doesn't volunteer that they have been a victim of domestic violence. Um, understanding that, you know, it, it is a, a subject that I think we need to recognize in every aspect. Um, it's relevant not just to custody cases, it's relevant to regular divorces. Um, and, and there's a number of ways it can occur, not just through physical harm, you know, psychologically, financially, as I've previously touched on, control of finances, and another number of other methods. But overall, I, I do think um, that that training and, and really, unfortunately, it seems that the rise in domestic violence has caused um, you know, the courts and the community to really to really lean in on that, but there were there are a number of groups here in the valley um, that that help and work with domestic violence victims. One of which I've attended seminars on is Defenders of Children. Um, they they work with the local communities. There's a number of attorneys tied to that. Um, therapeutic supervising supervisors um, uh, and a lot of other uh, resources available. But I, I think that's it on my end. Um, yeah, if you need me to touch on anything else, I certainly can. I think you're on mute, Jenny. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Travis. No, I really appreciate your perspective. And wow, how interesting to hear. I guess I hadn't thought about the fact that, you know, going on um, virtual would have such an impact both on both ways, on both sides, um, in how things, things move forward in the court, in how, um, yeah, I mean, how that whole whole thing goes. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much for giving us your perspective and your experience with that. We really appreciate that. Of course. Wonderful. So now we'll hear from Terry Ellers. She's a marriage and family therapist with postpartum and relationship counseling. Thanks so much for being here, Terry. Would you mind unmuting and sharing with us your experience? Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me. First of all, thank you, um, Travis, so much for everything you shared. As a CASA yeah, I'd love to have a conversation with you about how I can maybe be better support. Um, so one of the things that I've seen um, in COVID is some kind of leveling of the playing ground in some ways as far as, um, you know, relationships. Because I think all of us is either, you know, both personally and professionally um, have seen the impacts of COVID, you know, on our relationships. And so I think we're starting to have um, more conversation. And I see that as um, a really positive thing. Um, I think people are talking about mental health um, in a little bit different way, a little bit um, with a little bit less stigma, I guess. Um, platforms like this, there's a lot of um, free resources that we're able to offer clients that we weren't able to, you know, before COVID. And I see that as an ongoing resource and um, a really positive. Um, I've seen for, so I have been seeing um, new, new parents, new families online for about five years before COVID um, because a lot of mamas, you know, can't drive yet or um, they're five or six hours away from um, a therapist that has some specialty in this area. Um, of course, I've seen an increase in that, but I think that telehealth has been um, a helpful resource in most ways. Um, the ways that I've seen that not being helpful is that continuity of care. So if a client um, has to move out of state or there's a divorce and one person's out of state, then we don't get to have that continuity of care because of the 
um, limitations that we have on the statues in Arizona. Um, the things that I think have gotten better, I think that um, I've seen way more couples coming in because of telehealth. You know, one parent can be, or, you know, one partner can be at work or different works. And then we have this platform where they can come together. Um, if it's a volatile situation, they're not in the car driving home and I'm worrying about them. Um, so it gives them a little bit of space. Um, so many resources. So um, spending a little bit more time um, getting resources to my clients than just the time, you know, the very limited time that I get to be with them. Um, and I see that as helpful. Um, I think people are happy to have that. Trying to really connect people into community because that's how we heal and that's how we're getting through all of this. Um, isolation is, I just read a research um, report that said isolation is equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So that's a pretty tangible, like to be able to look at that. It's really, you know, we need to be connected. We're, we're human beings, we're very relational. Um, I think too, seeing that this COVID is something that's impacted us on a worldwide, um, again, kind of that all humanity, I think that's been helpful. Um, what has been worse, um, you know, the disparity that we see um, in the different, you know, in the black communities and, um, you know, our different cultures, um, definitely, I mean, the mortality rate is three to four times higher for a black mom. Um, birth trauma has, has been on the rise because of, you know, separation, you know, maybe moms in a different state or different country can't come help and it's a first baby. So seeing a lot of dynamics really impacted a lot of um, a lot more postpartum seeing more postpartum men um, this last two years um, some things that i've seen that have been helpful have been again being able to like just normalize and look at what overwhelm does to us as a human right we have that window of tolerance where we have all of our emotions and we're going to go outside of that, you know, we're either going to, you know, flip our lids or we're going to shut down. And so people to have, to be able to give people tools that not just help with COVID, but with life skills. And I'm seeing parents like co-partner on some, on using a lot of these strategies with their kids um, in ways that don't, maybe they wouldn't be doing, which I, I it's just been really exciting to see people coming to me with a positive exception, things that are getting better. Um, yeah, and, and I've been talking to a lot of my clients about the power and importance of play, right? We've been isolated. And so what that can look like, um, because we are, I mean, COVID is just an isolating, you know, we feel like we don't have the choices. So people are being more um, creative, you know? in their families and outside of their family. So I just, it, it's just, it's kind of humbling to be a therapist during this. It's just, I think I'm seeing more growth in my, in the people that I'm seeing quicker than I was before. Maybe there's more of a sense of urgency for us, right? Um, wow, yeah. Yeah. So I could talk about this for days, but I don't wanna, uh, I want to hear what everyone else has to say. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Terry, for sharing um, this. Yeah, your experience with this and how interesting that is. That's interesting that it seems like, and sometimes it's going quicker, um, and that parents are starting to use, you know, some of these tools with their children. I think that's awesome, and you know, maybe a totally positive thing that's come out of a pandemic. So many more of us have been aware of mental health. Um, but yeah, wow, that's fascinating. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, now I'd like to move on to Commissioner Boyle um, to talk to us about his experience um, with the impact of COVID-19 on relationships. Thanks so much, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I'm Commissioner Joshua Boyle, and I'd like to just give a little bit of background of sort of where what I've seen 
through this pandemic because um, at the beginning of the pandemic and the lockdowns, I was a family law attorney in private practice, um, similar to Mr. Owen. And then I was appointed to the bench in June of 2021. And at the time, there had been so many judges that had retired that they actually put me into a family law judge's spot for four months, which was very nice to be able to go from family law practice to become uh, a family law judge for a few months. And then now I'm at initial appearance court, um, which is where if someone's arrested, then they um, are brought in, you know, they have to see a judge within 24 hours. And so that's what I'm doing now. So I am seeing at this point now within my career, I'm, I'm seeing the domestic violence situations very shortly after they've happened. Um, and then, you know, from June to approximately October was seeing, you know, family law cases from a judge's perspective. And then prior to that, from an attorney's perspective. And um, what I wanted to, I, I really appreciate being um, being able to follow Travis because I think he did a good job explaining a lot of things that have been happening in the legal community, some of the great benefits that have come from, um, from technology and that it has allowed people to still be able to connect to court. Whereas otherwise before, you know, if they have to choose between a job or going to an order of protection hearing, they may have chosen the job because that's gonna keep them a job. And now they have that ability to connect. And so I, and I know that many other um, judges and our presiding judge in Maricopa County, um, Joe Welty feels strongly about this, that there needs to be able to be this good access to the courts. Um, it's good when people can come in person. I think in some ways that that can be better to be in a courtroom. And in some ways though, it can be more intimidating or people just don't have the financial means to be able to do it. Um, either to take the time off of work or to get the transportation. And it just makes it very difficult. And so it's important that everyone have access to the courts and to our, I mean, you know, frankly, to our, our country and our state's laws. Um, what I wanted to, and, and Sunny had, had explained to me that I could be personal with this. So I do want to tell um, some personal things as well. Um, and as a family law judge, we often will see child interviews. Sometimes that will have been through a counselor. Sometimes um, there's a group called conciliation services that we have at the courts um, that then they interview the children. They're very good at that. Um, I never interview children. Judges don't do that here in Maricopa County. Some of the outlying counties do, um, but we certainly don't. And so what I noticed, um, and I had seen some of those before as an attorney, but I saw quite a few um, acting as a family law judge. What I noticed was that there are a lot of children who talk about distracted parents and parents on phones and things like that. And I think um, you know, some of that may be situational because many parents had to work virtually during that time. But um, you know, I, I really appreciated what Terry said about the importance of, or the power of play. And so while technology has been this great blessing to allow us to keep jobs, to connect with the courts and things like that, it can also be a curse in terms of, um, I think for many parents, and I'll include myself in this, I've got uh, an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and one on the way. Um, and so, you know, at, with the stress of, of, of a new situation, COVID, uh, you know, we'll often cope by, we can get online and just, uh, you know, I'll just watch a YouTube video or read an article or something like that. Um, and also, if I'm working, I need to keep my children distracted. Um, and so I'll put them in front of screens as well. Um, and, you know, I noticed that I wasn't making as much time to play with my children. And I know that that's very important. And, um, and that it can actually be a generational thing, by the way, um, the, the power of play and a parent demonstrating how to play with their children. And so the, the very personal story I'd like to share is that my grandfather, um, he grew up in a, a small town in Heber, Arizona, a small town, and he loved his parents very much, but there wasn't a lot of affection showed. And um, he was working uh, for quite some time with a, a particular religious leader out of state. Um, and he would see this individual get down on the ground and play with his young children. 
And because he learned that, he saw that and he said, I, I, that's really good parenting. I want to be a parent like that. Um, and then because of that, he would get down on the ground with his children and play with them, you know, pretend he was a bear or he was a horse and they could ride on his back. Um, and so he passed that on to my mom. My mom would get down on the ground and play with my siblings and I. Um, and then that's something that I've certainly done with my children as well. And I've had to remember during this pandemic, no, I still need to do that. Um, that even though there's all these distractions, maybe more than ever before, it's very important that I, um, I do take that time to get down on the ground. And I've seen it um, a, a few places before that, you know, at, at least 10 minutes, children need at least 10 minutes. And frankly, I don't think that's too hard. I mean, sometimes it seems like you got to play with your kids and, okay, I got to take them to the park or do something. No, you can just, uh, I mean, one of my kids' favorite games is I'm the big bad wolf and they're the three little pigs and we chase around the house. Um, you know, and I think there's just a lot of like that and there's other games that can be played. And so I, I hope that, um, you know, with this wonderful organization that there can be more of an encouragement of play and even of here are some games that you can play maybe even videos, here's how you can do it. Because I think if you haven't seen it, you don't know. You know, it seems like, well, I don't know how to do this, but it's not hard. I mean, kids love to play. Um, you know, when I go to the playground with my kids, I will we'll play Big Bad Wolf again or something like that. And it's incredible to me how every time I do that, there will be immediately three or four kids who come up and say, can I play too? They want to play and they want to play with a grown up. They can see that this is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm not su suggesting that their parents don't play with them, but just that they just immediately are attracted to it and just absolutely love it. And so, um, again, I, I would, that's what I would hope would happen, um, would be more of an emphasis on play and to remember that, hey, we need to disconnect. We've connected our children more. We've connected more online and let's disconnect and, and play a little bit more. And if we use the internet and connection to teach people how to play, then wonderful. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the highest purposes of it. Uh, one thing I'll also briefly say is with many people that I saw both in my courtroom and in my practice as well, um, they would have to Skype with their children. And most children don't like to Skype. Um, my mom, again, kind of just being incredible in general, she would do these 30 minute or longer Skype sessions with her kids, or excuse me, with her grandchildren. And could just keep them entertained. It was remarkable. And so um, I hope that there are some resources for that, that when parents are separated from their children for a while, that they could be taught as well. This is how you can engage with your children because most of us don't know how to do that. And rightfully so. I mean, it's kind of hard to know. So, hey, how, you know, parents will get on. How are you doing? You know, what's going on? How's school? Well, you know, depending on their age, they probably aren't going to be able to respond very well to that. But if you know some games, my, my mom would do lots of hand games that she'd teach them and songs and again, would remarkably keep them entertained for long periods of time. And so that's something else that I would hope that maybe there could be some development um, and some, uh, you know, some more learning about and, and some presentations to parents. You know, if you're going to be away from your children, even for a week, and you'd like to connect with them, here's maybe some ways that you can connect with them based on their ages. Um, and I will, I'm sure my mom would be okay. I would volunteer my mother. If anyone is interested in, in looking into this, um, I think that she is a great example and, and would be happy to teach. So I think I've gone on too long, but yes, there is more conflict because of the pandemic. Um, but I worry too, again, the big point being that we have connected so much that we may be losing those more close familial um, connections and important relationships. And so just a good reminder to, to remember to play. Oh, thanks so much for that, Commissioner Boyle. Wow, what a great reminder. Oh, yeah, you made me realize that I haven't been playing with my children as much as I wish that I would. Um, but yeah, it is that easy. Hmm. Yeah, what a great idea. And it sounds like we need to really um, co-opt your mom to help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she, she's very passionate about uh, early childhood development. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your experience. Really appreciate that. Um, so next, I'd like to hear from um, Stephen Miller from the Chrysalis Shelter. If you can unmute, unmute yourself, Stephen, we'd love to hear your perspective on this. I know you've been Great. also doing a lot of changes during this time. 
Thank you. I really appreciate you guys having me. Thanks to all the other speakers. It's a tough act to follow, all three of you guys. Um, no, my name is Stephen Miller. I'm, uh, I oversee the development department here at Chrysalis. Um, just a little bit about uh, who we are as an organization. So Chrysalis has been here in the Valley for 40 years, since 1981. Um, they're a leader in providing broad-based solutions to prevent domestic violence, um, particularly using a trauma-informed approach. So a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, um, they go back to really one of our core values, which is uh, approaching working with families um, coming from a place of trauma-informed care. Um, we operate a number of different programs. Uh, most notably, we have an emergency shelter at a secure location um, here in North Phoenix. Uh, we offer transitional housing. Um, the difference there, someone can stay at the shelter for up to 120 days. Transitional housing is rental assistance for up to two years. We also offer master's level clinical therapy from, uh, for both individuals and families, um, as well as a mobile victim advocacy team um, that actually works with Maricopa County Superior Court um, and provides an added level of care for anyone who's going through the, the court process. Um, we also, this is pretty unique to Chrysalis, we offer an offender treatment program. So we're working with 140 offenders each week um, through the adult probation department, providing uh, classes that, that focus on accountability um, and really try to break that cycle of abuse. So, um, you know, in, in a normal year, we would serve around 1,500 total clients. Um, so one of the first impacts that we felt, you know, two years ago was how can we keep that same level of care, um, but also navigate, you know, all of the, in some cases, restrictions or in some cases, just changes in our services. Um, you know, when you look at the factors that were exacerbated by COVID. So housing uncertainty, financial pressure, stress around the home, all of those factors are the same things that lead to an uptick in domestic violence. Um, so the two really went hand in hand as COVID um, and shelter in place in particular really permeated the community. We saw an immediate rise in calls for service. Um, I think it was a Phoenix Police Department put out a statistic about a year, a year or so ago, that um, you know, domestic violence-related homicides are up 140 percent from before the pandemic. So, it, it's a very real link between the two. Um, you know, we when in normal times, Chrysalis would operate pretty much at near capacity across all of our programs. Um, we know that domestic violence, you know, it's it's pervasive in the community. It knows no socioeconomic boundaries. Um, and so we, we've constantly seen, you know, a continued rise in not only people seeking services, but, um, you know, people willing to just be able to come and just talk about their relationship. Um, so I want to share a quote from our, our CEO that I think really perfectly uh, encapsulated this. The pandemic put everyone in a position of desperation, anxiety, and anxiousness. When you take that and you factor in abuse or an unhealthy relationship, it can make it very difficult to leave. So that's really what we've seen kind of on the front lines. Um, on the lighter side, in terms of what's been getting better or what's gotten better, um, like I mentioned, more people are seeking services. We've seen our, our wait list for our master's level counseling um, has risen by 400%. So we are definitely expanding our programs, which is um, a very exciting place to be. Um, there's definitely a need for it. And more people appear to be comfortable seeking help. I think with a lot of things, you know, as we hopefully move into this post-COVID transition phase, um, people are talking about a reset and how this has been an opportunity to reevaluate, um, you know, every aspect of their lives. And relationships are a huge part of that. So if someone has had an opportunity, um, you know, to, to really look and make sure they're being valued in their relationship, um, and look at the power and control dynamics there, that this, this is a chance for them, if it, if it is potentially dangerous, for them to also reset. Um, and um, lastly, you know, I, I wanted to talk about one of the silver linings, you know, here at Chrysalis, we, we talk a lot about collective trauma. And I think we've all experienced um, throughout COVID, you know, a sense of collective trauma. Um, you add me in, you know, potentially having to restart your life 
um, through you know an emergency shelter program. Um, you know, and that can be a lot on a family. But one of the things that really inspires me when I spend time over at our shelter is I'm always touched by the sense of community. And I think a lot of you know the folks that that come through and that stay there. Um, they're in the process of rewiring their lives and building new trust in people, um, reestablishing, you know, just faith in relationships. Um, and the, the shelter can be a really cool place to see truly that village approach of everyone helping out, being there to help watch the kids if someone needs to go to a doctor's appointment or a job interview, um, eating together, you know, just spending all of, really spending that quality time together. So um, when I think of, you know, it's been a crazy two years, but I do think that people have been resilient and families are coming out of this um, stronger than ever. Mm. Thanks so much, Stephen. I really appreciate that. And yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that I think a lot of us drew closer together, even though it felt like we've been so isolated. I know we've noticed that at fourth trimester as well, that oftentimes it's the um, the connections that we do have and are able to make that become that much more strong and um, parents recognizing uh, that they need each other too, right? I mean, I think that's another huge thing, how much we need each other and how much we took it for granted before. Well, thank you all for your wonderful perspectives. Wow, that was really, um, really huge and so much so much to digest. I feel like I'm going to need to watch the whole thing again just to listen again to all the, all the pieces of information that you all provided. Um, so we do have a couple of minutes for questions. If, um, if anyone has any for our speakers before we move into our breakout sessions or our breakout groups, does anyone have any questions maybe in the chat? I'm going to peek in the chat right now. Okay. And you're welcome to just shout them out too, if you'd like, that's fine at this point. Wait just a minute. Okay. Like we've got one. So Emily says, I'm biased, but maternal early childhood home visiting programs are a really great resource for families. They're free and offer individualized support for parents to help with bonding and parent child interactions, activities, community resources, domestic violence, and mental health screenings, along with general support, depending on what the family needs. I wonder if any of these individuals are using this service. Yeah. And you know, I know that's been a huge thing. Um, you know, Nurse Family Partnership, I have several friends and there's several people who have been working closely with us who were working with their families during the pandemic, mostly virtually, but um, having that contact and that um, that person to make those connections is huge. Yeah. Do you um, know if there, if any of the, the families that you're working with, the question to our speaker, are, are working with any of these home visiting programs? None that I know of. So I would love to get have that be a resource. Yeah. yeah, I have other places that I refer out to, but I would love to have that information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I, you know, I've, I've heard of and I've, I've been told, you know, through speaking with the mental health professionals that I do work with, um, half the battle is making clients and the community aware that these resources are available in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much out there. And I, I think really, you know, getting them the help they, they need or deserve and realizing that you, you don't have to have a six figure salary in order to be able to take in these services and, and benefit from them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd love more information about those programs too. And I, I, my question for everyone is, is there some sort of an online resource of just whatever your needs may be, here's a website you can go to um, because I've been trying to compile a list. I mean, I see many people who are now facing homelessness or who simply are indigent. Um, and, you know, they have substance abuse issues. They need a place to stay, et cetera. And um, I want to be able to give them resources so they don't just leave here. You know, they've been arrested and if they're going to leave, which often they're able to, but then what, what are they going to go back to um, or what resources do they have? And I would just point out, like, this isn't, this doesn't just affect um, those who maybe are of a lower socioeconomic class. I received a phone call the other day from a very, uh, a very educated friend of mine um, who has a very educated family and his sister-in-law had just been in an abusive relationship. And 
I mean, they didn't, they didn't know, and it's fine. I mean, they didn't know this information, but you know, how to get an order of protection, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so if these are much more educated people that don't know that, and, and, and not that that makes them better in any means, in any way, let me be clear about that, but just that you would think that they would have all of these resources and would, would be able to easily get this information. And I suppose they knew to call me to get some of that information, but, um, but I, I hope that that's available because I, I know that there have been people, certainly clients I've seen in my past, as well as people coming to the court, courts who don't know that they can go down to court to get an order of protection. They don't know about all of these resources. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I know about 211, right? The 211 line is the one that I can think of like off the top of my head, but I know Southwest Human Development, Emily Singleton, she she's on the call and they have a birth to five helpline. So for parents with young children, I know that they can often um, reach out through that to get that. But yeah, you're right. It feels like there should be more more access and more awareness as well. Postpartum Support International, if you go to postpartum.net, um, you can go to your, you know, your county, your city. They have um, lots of free resources. They have great resources for dads, which I love. Yeah. Well, I want to just thank all of our speakers. It's now time to go into breakout sessions. So if you're able to join us speakers for those breakouts, we would love to have you and um, talk a little bit more deeply about some of these issues. I know I know I feel like I need to share my own experience and I, I don't know if other people have their own, but um, so we'll take a couple minutes.